I am so honored to have our guest. Like this has been a guest that I've been looking forward to having for since we started the series. She is the true definition of going from an assistant to the CEO. Please give it up for one of the baddest women in business, Ms. Dia Sims. <laughs> goodness now understand something when I told a lot of my peers and a lot of my friends who I was having this week everybody had the same reaction like oh you got a big one <laughs> so <laughs> I actually started to get nervous I'm like oh my god like you know I got to be buttoned up super prepared so dear you know you, number one and this is just all honesty I'm so excited to have you because I have watched you rise through the ranks and you have just blown past everybody. That's number one. But number two, you are our first woman to, to ever grace the power move make a stage. Ooh, la la, yes. It's past due, you late. You late. We, we know Dia takes her time serious, so we're gonna get right into it. Thank you. And, and Dia, just, just so you know, Dia was here an hour early. Yes. Everybody is usually 15, 20 minutes late, so I wasn't expecting it. No, look, let's be clear. Press calls, anywhere in the world, I'm there. Early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> D, I want to take it back to the beginning. Yes. Coming up, what you want to be? Mm. I didn't know what I wanted to be, um, but I knew I wanted to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do with my time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I actually grew up in East Elmhurst, Queens, um, which it was a neighborhood where there was a lot of up and coming hip hop at the time. Like I was maybe like nine or 10, but Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, um, Kwame, Herbie Lovebug, they all lived near me. So I would be like nine seeing Salt and Pepper practice in the next backyard all the time, like over and over and over again. And I, of course at nine, I didn't really realize it, but I don't think it's a coincidence that I ended up working in this industry for really, really Herbie Lovebug and East Elmhurst was a precursor to what Puff became. Wow, wow. Family dynamic, mom, dad, two family households? Yes, so I grew up, uh, mom, dad, still you know, together to this day. Beautiful. Um, my dad is, is like brilliant. He was a New York uh, police officer. And um, it's actually an interesting story, like where he grew up, he was really smart, he was handsome, he could sing, but he grew up in the environment where like his aunts would be like, you could do a lot, if you really try hard, you could be a pimp one day. <laughs> like, you know I mean? like, that was like, if you really like all those skills. So for him, like to come out of that, and, and he grew up also in a neighborhood where like they hated the police, right? No different than it is today, where he would see people being wrongly jailed, wrongly imprisoned, set up, beat up, killed. Um, so it was somewhat counterintuitive for him to come out of originally in the military to go into the New York police force. But he said to me, even as a kid, if you want to change something, you have to change it from within. Um, so he became a police officer. He actually went on to start the first division in the New York, uh, in the NYPD Internal Affairs that was strictly focused on training officers and how they need to have appropriate interactions and with, with treat uh, black and Spanish neighborhoods with civility, put a protocol in place. Obviously, a lot of that has obviously gone to the wayside. He's retired now. But, <laughs> but, um, but it was an important example for me, I think, growing up to see, like, it, you, the best way to change something is actually to become a part of it. Wow, that's a great advice. Um, was education big in your household? It was, but you know, I will say, I think a lot of, at least when I was growing up, um, I grew up in an environment where everyone was, the, you get your job, you go to college, and you know, it would be amazing if you become a doctor or a lawyer, or you take, in New York, I'm still a kid, it was like, take every city test, right? Um, what was not really encouraged, which I would really encourage everybody in this room, anybody under the sound of our voices, is really to look at entrepreneurship. That to me, that wasn't something that was talked a lot about. Even though, you know, to the point about the people I saw, I saw Play open up a barbershop. I saw these mm -hmm. guys, I saw this thing that was like a cool hobby. All of a sudden, like, damn, they got a whole movie called House Party in every theater around the United States. Like, this is just my neighbors doing something fun, and now it's a global phenomenon. I think, um, so I think it was, it was seeping into me like by osmosis. 
but it was not drilled into me the way I feel like it is in other cultures. Um, I'll talk a lot about the difference between actual innovation and like a small improvement and how like iPhones didn't come from, y'all probably don't even know, but from like Palm Pilots or, you know what I'm saying, Netflix didn't come from Blockbuster. I think it's the same thing with, we want to see real diversity, we want to have real ownership. It may, not become, it may not come from getting the best job, it may come from like you starting your own thing or five of you getting together. And when that could be whatever, be the best nail tech, be the, be get the cleaning, whatever it is, but owning it is something that is different than, um, you know, just being, not, not that there's anything wrong with having a great job, but I think that the one thing that was missing for me that I'll say as loudly as much as I can is look at entrepreneurship as a path. Wow. Coming up, where'd you go to school? So college I, in particular. Oh, college. I went to um, undergraduate. I went to Morgan State in Baltimore, and I got my uh, master's degree from a school called uh, Florida Institute of Technology. I used to work for the Department of Defense, negotiating defense contracts, which is a long story. Is that your first job that out of college? That was my first job out of college, Before yeah. we go there, what'd you major yeah. in? I majored in psychology. Okay. Both undergrad and grad? My master's degree was in management. Okay. Yeah. Talk to me. First job out of college. My first job out of college was the Department of Defense. I went to school in Maryland, and um, again, way before your time, but there in the late uh, 80s, there was a big scandal where the Department of Defense was caught spending like $550 on like a $3 hammer, and it was all, or like $700 on a regular $49.99 toilet. Um, so <laughs> the Department of Defense was under all this scrutiny. LA Times had done an expose, a whole bunch of things happened. So I graduated 10 years later, they finally put a program in place where they were like, we're going to go out and get talented graduates, strong GPAs who, who have a, a particular work ethic, and we're going to hire them to work for the federal government. When you work for the government, you have like these pay bands, right? So you're like a GS5, GS7. This program, they will hire you and you get to skip like five grades in three years, but they'll train you like crazy. So I had like secret clearance, which was very cool, which expire, but you can try to see this with me. Um, but, <laughs> um, but the most important thing was they sent me to be trained in negotiations for literally two years. And to this day, particularly I would say this to the women, it's, incre it's an incredibly important skill that has come in handy in every job with my six-year-old for bedtime, with my husband, with what movie, when I'm negotiating with Puff on my next raise. Like, you know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, it was the best first job you could have coming out of college. And like, the skills of understanding how to negotiate with somebody should not be some esoteric special skill, right? I actually feel like we should be teaching it in like first and second grade so that we understand how to understand our value and then package it up in exchange for what you deserve. That's amazing. I didn't know this. They actually <laughs> sent you away for two years to learn? Not away for two years, but, but part of it would be like you work program, for two weeks, then you go to class for two weeks, you know what I really? mean? And learn about, yes, the about procurement. negotiation. Yes. Wow. Okay, so I know you did promotion in yes. D.C. Yes. Where does that fall into play? Were you doing promotion while like, you were at the Department of Defense? So, or is so it many after? jobs. So <laughs> I, um, yeah, so I was at, D I left the program early because at some point it got a little bit boring. Okay. So I started off with the Navy and Naval Air. And in, in defense, air is kind of the more, you see the movies, like more the exciting. But I was in this very small town. And as a, I just, you know, I was a New Yorker at that time. And this was a town where um, literally like horses would cross the street in the middle of the day. They had, this whole base had just moved there. So more street lights were being added and the town was in an uproar, like all these street lights and cars <laughs> and this town is about to turn. In, they were scared they were gonna turn to the next town, which to me was like still a small town. So it just got boring as like a young woman. I was like, I'm gonna transfer to DC. The, the agency that I transferred to was very slow and they would give me projects that I would literally complete in a week that would be like due months later. Um, and I was like, this is just, just not for me. Um, so I left and um, uh, at the time I actually got into advertising sales at a radio station in Maryland. Mm -hmm. But when I started getting my chops in understanding marketing more and how to sell is when I got into promotion. So uh, me and a group of uh, my friends, some other young ladies, we used to throw parties in DC um, and they were big. They were like a thousand people every week. And it was just another great entrepreneurial way to just get some extra cash in your pocket and build a lot of relationships. So slowly but surely, you are seeping into the world of entrepreneurship. Now, are you working in D.C.? Is this with Mark Barnes? Yes. Really? Yes. So this is Mark Barnes, for any of you guys who don't know, is probably the biggest promoter ever in D.C., would definitely, you say? Definitely, yeah. You know, had his own club, big time guy. Working with Mark Barnes, what did you learn? 
Mark is like, literally I would try to hire people who used to work for Mark uh -huh. to work for Puff. He's like the perfect training ground. Um, he's enormous, he's a real perfectionist. So he was, and he's a consummate host. It was very similar to Puff. Like he really cared when you came into one of his clubs. It wasn't just like, I'm gonna make a nightclub and I just want you to come and play the music real loud. He took so much pride in the fact that like, if you came into his club on a Monday at 2 p.m., it's gonna be spotless. The food that he serves is amazing and delicious. The way you uh, conducted yourself and interacted with his guest, he took extremely seriously and it would take us to like, I'm going to take you to the Four Seasons, see how they treat you here. I'm going to take you to St. Regis, see really? how you need to embody that when you are, even though we were just promoters for him at that time before I did work for him for a while too. Um, and and it, there, there was a couple other things that I feel like I really learned there. When I worked for him, it was a relatively small, uh, it was a place called Republic Gardens and the U Street Corridor in DC. And it was a very popular place, but it was relatively small. But at some point he asked me to start helping the manage his bar so I got to kind of see the books. And I started doing the math in my head, and I was like, oh, he's making millions of dollars every year. I, was, I didn't even realize, so I was young, and I was like, wait, hold on. This is like, this is like seven, eight million dollars. It just never really occurred to me. It was like the first time I realized, like, oh, I could just make millions of dollars if you just really just think about the math um, of what it takes kind of person by person. So I really started being conscious of, like, 500 people at this amount, five, you know, three drinks on average, da, 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 and thinking about how was I going to build my, my personal story every time I spent my time with a real math-based approach. I think the second thing, and I take this uh, like forever in the way I hire people, was he would take us all, the group of us around to different restaurants, or we may have to go to Home Depot because we were building out a tent for a big event. He was looking for talent everywhere. So it didn't necessarily matter if you had the exact experience. You didn't have to, have, you didn't have to previously be a cocktail waitress to be a cocktail waitress for him. You didn't have to previously be promoted to promote for him. If we were at Home Depot and he noticed that the cash register woman on aisle 10 was moving crazy fast, she remembered everybody's name, hey Bob, from such and such contractor. She was doing the math in her head. She put a bow on the bag. She was really, he would be like, we need to talk to her. We need to hire her and put her on the register. We'll train her. She has what we're looking for in terms of an approach, right, and an intensity and a pride in her work. And to this day, I'm not necessarily always looking for people that have the specific technical skills. I'm more like, will they be able to rock in this environment? Are they, like for me, I actually really care. I think you've probably seen me with this. Are they like not assholes? Like literally in my culture decks, it says like, this is an asshole free zone. You can't be good enough to be here because I'm not working with somebody 20 hours a day. That's like a problem for the rest of the team. So like, we're gonna work hard. We don't expect bullshit, but we can say please. and We can say thank you and we can be kind to one another. And I learned that lesson from him, I think, in my mid-20s. Oh, that's a great, these are great lessons to learn. <laughs> and for, for the people in the room and also the people who are going to watch this around the globe via YouTube or where have you, these lessons, you know, it just goes to show, you, no matter where you start, mm -hmm. you can develop a skill set that's going to benefit you because you're talking about things that you picked up 20 years ago. Yeah that serve you today. So that's amazing. Tell me your transition from DC to New York. So back I, to New York rather. Yeah, so I was um, I was also doing pharmaceutical sales because I was like, okay, I like promoting, but I like health benefits. How can I do both, <laughs> right? So I got a job doing pharmaceutical sales during the day and I was still promoting in the evenings and 9-11 um, happened. Okay. And I was probably, I was like the only person that moved back to New York. Um, because it was such a scary time, and um, I just was like, you know what, whatever happens, I want to be near my family. You know what I mean? So I actually left Maryland, came up to New York, um, and I took a job in pharmaceutical sales up here in the South Bronx in Washington Heights. So you come back to New York. Are you thinking, hey, I want to be in pharmaceutical sales for the rest of my career, or are you, is just just a job that is a transitional state for you? It was definitely transitional, but I, I won't pretend. I definitely was not a person who had like every next step mapped out. Mm -hmm. um, I am a, I'm a big believer in, and forgive me, it's a little bit corny, but like whatever you're doing, like just being the best in that moment. Like I've been a lot of places where people be like, well, I do this receptionist job just halfway because this is not my real job. I'm like, no, it's your real job today. So like whatever you're doing in that moment, I'm like, sh I'm just, I try to just, shine in that moment. And to be honest, pharmaceutical sales is a great job. I was like, this is great. You got a car. I'm going to win a trip to Hawaii. This is terrific. I was like, I don't have to go to an office. So it is actually a cool, it was a cool industry to be in. Um, and I just tried to be 
as good as I could be in that moment. Um, I love learning. Um, so I was always conscious of like, what new industry is going on? Whatever, what's everybody doing? Like trying to always hear and learn and learn and learn until the next opportunity came up, which ended up being in um, a friend of mine was actually looking for a job. So I just brought her up to Power 105 radio station because I knew somebody up there and I was like, you, you would be great at this. I'm gonna introduce you. And I, I, was, I was very happy in my job. I was mm -hmm. like, you should just meet these people and I'll just sit here. And while I was talking to the general manager, he was like, well, I want, you should come work here too. Like, why don't you come? I was like, no, I'm not doing radio sales anymore. That's like selling drugs. You get paid, like selling radio sales, <laughs> you get, you gotta cover your own salary, basically. You work on what's called a draw. So if you make $5,000 a month, you need to have sold enough to cover that amount. Um, and I was like, wow, pharmaceutical sales is terrific. You don't have to pay me. So I, I, was, I had nothing to lose. So I just like asked for like, what I thought was a crazy number. And um, so that ended up being basically like my first six figure job. And they was like, okay, we'll, we'll pay you that amount. Um, and I took it. And at that time, at that time, it was a big deal when Power 105 launched. I don't know if you probably remember I this remember. too. Wow. Because Hot 97 was the epicenter of hip hop in the world, and really still mm -hmm. is. Um, so the idea that this, con this controversial Me Too station would, would try to come against it, now it seems ridiculous, but at the time it was actually a big deal. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'm happy. I, I love hip hop, I love music, I'll, I'll do it. So I took the job, started. And it's ad sales? Uh, ad sales. Okay. So selling radio time, selling event sponsorships. Um, and shortly after I, after I started, maybe a few months after I started, um, the friend that I, had, that I knew there quit and the GM gave me all of his accounts, which were all the music labels in New York, which was essentially how this kind of started. Bad Boy Records is funny at the time, respectfully, was so loyal to Hot 97, they refused to advertise on Power 105. Do you remember this? I remember it very well. Yeah, and yeah. I'll go one better for you. When Power 105, came to, into fruition um, many years ago, Puff took at least, I don't know, six months to a year before he ever stepped in the building. He, he just had that much loyalty to yeah. the radio station that broke him, which was Hot 97. Yes. So then I broke Bad Boy Records to, be the, to, to advertise on the station. Um, and then got Sean John with Mel Smith. I don't know, you probably don't even know this. Yeah. Right, so uh, so no, we didn't no. know each other back then, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, so... Um, so then, so once you I were started, a big deal in the building. Yeah, it was a big deal to them because they were trying to, to get back. It was yeah. a big deal that like to be able to get back at that time, as you can imagine, it was like we finally got Bad Boy Records yeah. to advertise on the station. Um, so that worked out well. And then at some point, one of the executives, Mignon, um, who was an executive that worked with with Puff and the Bad Boy team, called me and said, um, "This is this is later," and said, "Puff is looking to hire a chief of staff. Would you be interested in applying for the role?" And and she basically, honestly, I think she felt like she was like, Puff sends emails at 3 a.m., you send emails at 3 a.m., I think y'all just get along, right? <laughs> so I was like, okay. Um, so I was like, sure, I'll interview for it. Uh, interview with a woman who had been there for many years, Vashta, who passed me on to interview with Puff. Shortest interview I ever had, it was like five and a half, six minutes. He has the best poker face, so I had no idea um, what happened. And they called me and said, he would like to offer you the job, but you don't have a lot of experience managing large teams. Would you be willing to come on and start as his assistant. And I literally was like, you could call me the janitor, but this is what you gotta pay me. And then, um, so I just said yes, took it, started a couple weeks later. Question for you. Yes. What was your first impression of Puff? So. And, and was that your first time meeting him? Yeah, so I think the funny thing, you know, growing up here, it was very much in that era where, you know, Puff, we used to throw Christmas parties, I forgot the place up the street. So mm -hmm. we had some people in common, but mm -hmm. by no means we know each other um, before that time. I think, um, I don't know, I guess my first impression was, I mean, Puff is, a, Puff is an impressive person in the building. I think he asked really great questions. He was very serious, and I appreciate that he took it seriously, right? So it was not like a so frivolous thing So those four to minutes, him. he yes, took serious. he took it serious. He was very direct. <laughs> he asked me like real questions. It was short, but I'm, I could see that his mind moved fast, and I felt like we were compatible and to be able to be quick from a pace standpoint. Um, so my initial thinking was just like, I respect that there must be a part of him, even him starting off as an intern working for Andre Harrell, that understands how important the role of assistant is, right? He's not passing up to nobody. He's asking real questions. He's looking in my eye. And it may have been short, but it was intentional. So you come in, you interview for chief of staff. Yes. Foster calls you back? Yes. Hey, Puff loves you, likes you at the time, yes. impressed. You don't have experience managing a large team. Would you like to take his executive assistant? Yes. And as long as the number was right, you're like, I'm in. And I, I, can't, 
can't say this enough. Like, do not get caught up in the titles. What the thing that was interesting to me was I felt like this is somebody that I could learn from. And again, like I'm a perpetual, I think, you know, be a curious person in life. If you have an opportunity to go and learn something new, sometimes it may seem like a short term setback, but there could be real value in what you're adding to your worth, to nurturing your soul and your brain. And for me, I was like, this is something new and novel from somebody who I really respect. I'm happy to take the title of assistant. I've never been an assistant before. You know, it's so interesting because this is a reoccurring theme um, to so many people in the room who have come for some of our other interviews. The goal is to get in the door. I don't care what level you get in the door. You're looking at a woman who has risen through the ranks from, from assistant to CEO, but she had to first get in the door and if her ego got in the way, if she had just allowed her ego, no, absolutely not. I have experience, I'm making X amount of dollars at my job, I'm gonna stay here. How dare you, you know, even approach me to be your assistant? Who knows if she'd be on the stage today? So please always keep that in mind. Get in the door. You can take it from there if you have the skill set. How long did you work as his, as his assistant? So it's funny, I, was, I started October 5th, 2005, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I would say by December, he promoted me to senior executive assistant. And then a couple months later, um, I went in. So this is the other thing I would say. Be proactive. Be play. You know, I, I try to say, like, what's your elegantly impactful approach, right? So I knew that I felt very good about it. Like, I've started and I've made significant change in the time I've been here, right? You don't have to wait. The other thing. You don't have to be like, oh, let me learn and figure it out. I was like, no, I'm going to make changes in the first hour. Right, so that a month like later is going to be like somebody else's five months. Three months later is going to be like somebody else's year. So five months later, I walked in and I was like, hey, I'm looking at the chief of staff description. I feel like I'm feeling it. Like, like <laughs> how are we going to, like, and I actually really was more so like, what, you know, is there a gap that needs to be achieved because I feel like I'm already in this role? And he's like, no, you're doing a great job, blah, blah, blah. We'll think about it. I came back a couple weeks later and he said, okay, I'm, I'll think about it. He never formally said it to me, but a couple of days later, we were at the studio, and he introduced me to, um, actually, Stephen Hill at the time as his chief of staff. Nice. So I'm like, run away. I just changed my signature. <laughs> All the HLs like, I got promotion. <laughs> <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> um, and then from there, you know, went on to do a couple more roles, obviously. Okay, we're going to talk about those couple more roles, but <laughs> he, he, here's, your, here's a compliment I have to pass along to you. I have never, and I've worked with Puff for the better part of my adult life. Um, I have never seen anyone, including his quote unquote managers, manage Puff as effectively <laughs> as Dia Sims. Where did that come from? Y your style, like Puff, we all know, he is this mad genius. But your cool, calm, collective, result-driven self. I've just never seen anybody manage him the way that you did. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, we joke like in business, I'm like, you have like, you have Mary J, that was your thing in music. I was like, in business, I feel like we have that kind of synergy in terms of like getting things done. I'll give you one example. This is just really, again, back to the math of it. Um, at one point, I went to uh, Sean CFO Derek um, and and did it asked to do like a, a look at how much does Puff actually make an hour doing different activities right so I just like let me let me just do let me look at like if he's working on making the band if he's making a song if he's working on Ciroc whatever it is like how would that equate if I straight line and say like on this thing you losing $17,000 an hour on this thing you're making because I wanted to try to help be pragmatic about driving his time and saying like, look, Puff, you're an you're amazing visionary and you need to be free to do the things that only you can do, right? Things you're not good at is scheduling, right? And budget <laughs> management. Let me do those things so that you can spend all your time doing things that you do best. And then also like stop saying yes to things that are detracting from the time for you to be creative. Because you, this is a guy who's worked his whole life. He's to this day, like he, he'll say, it's not like he used to work at Oh, he learned what he used to work at Procter and Gamble, or like he used to work for Con Edison. He's been doing this since he was a teenager, around the clock. So there's certain skill sets that, like, no matter how great he is, he hasn't developed. I think the other thing is like knowing the balance of when somebody needs to be pushed and when somebody needs to be protected, right? So I would also say to him, and I said this very early on, I was like, um, I'm gonna do the best possible job. 
that nobody's gonna get in my way of that, including you, right? So like, if you're telling me like I have a certain responsibility or you have to be there and you feel sleepy today, and I'm like, nah, this is three million dollars. Like, I'm going to be the one banging on the door. Like, you said we had to get this done, so that means that's my responsibility to get it done. Like, I'm going to do absolutely every physical thing that I can do to get there because I care about my reputation as well. Dear, you go from assistant, chief of staff, president of Blue Flame, president of Combs Wine and Spirits, president of Combs Enterprises. Did I name them all? Mostly. Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another compliment I have to give you, and I think it's important for all of the ladies who are in the building, again, Dia Sims is our first um, lady to grace the, the, the power move, make a stage. Dia, and I say this in, I know we're in the Me Too era, so I'm going to watch my words very carefully. I think you're safe. You're safe, Zoe. But <laughs> I've never heard a peep of any rumors, any, and you went, you work, like, I'm from Bad Boy. It's, it's a guy-driven company. Mm -hmm. It is a male-driven culture in music and entertainment. Yeah. You're extremely effective in managing Puff and all of his affiliate businesses. But the way you carry yourself with such class and grace, and to this day, I, I, you know, I could barely, I don't know anything about, I know you're married, all of that good stuff. For any women out there, what are some of, I guess, the jewels you can give them in, in, in terms of, in, and I guess I'll say it the way Jay-Z said it, you move Show through a room full of vultures. vultures. That's a fact. <laughs> Crazy. No, 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 yeah. And I think that, um, I don't know, I think I feel like we kind of grew up, this is something I'm happy, not just me, I feel like I have a group of women who are amazing around me that understand that exact point. Like, I could think of times, even growing up well before, where being in environments that, you know, you had to ensure you were being treated like a lady, right? So I am a little old fashioned in that respect of, um, you know, I know it's a newfangled era, but I do feel like I, I, I love being a woman. Like I'm happy to be, like I, I, honestly, this is an exciting new thing for me. Like I've literally used to just literally just wear dresses only. So I was like, I'm gonna wear pants, I'm 44. <laughs> I was like, but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I think it's important when you think through the gravitas that you move throughout this world. I mean, women are so enormously powerful, and I think when you stand in that grace, people can sense that. Um, for me, though, I was very intentional in the beginning, and I don't, I, I'll give you one example, going back to promoting parties, right? Again, very different time 20 years ago. So when we were promoting parties, I would give the women I work with um, clipboards, because if not, Dude, somebody's gonna try to smack you on the butt or this and that. But once you put a clipboard in your hand, all of a sudden it was like, oh, excuse me, miss. Which way did it So I've always, I literally call it like the clipboard effect that everywhere I went after that, I tried to mentally think through what is that essence in the way that I'm gonna move in a room that says I'm here for business. Like I'm strictly here for business. And I'm, I'm happy, I'm gonna be cool, I'm pleasant, I love life, but it's not about um, anything. I'm here at work to work. Um, you know, so in the beginning, I would have no, and I actually don't suggest this, right? Because I think I, I respect so much how women now are like, nah, I don't have to have props. I don't need a clipboard taken seriously. Like, it's a different time. But when I started, I had no personal pictures. All the party, I grew up in this whole era. I didn't, you, for the first probably seven years, nobody saw me do a two step at a party. Like, I mean, I was very intentional about, like, I'm pleasant. But I'm not, I'm not here for a good time, I'm here. If I'm gonna spend all this time here, I have an objective to move forward and it's for the financial enrichment for me and my family. Okay, and, and, and it's obvious that you were very intentional. But so many women, and I want you to speak to the women in particular in business, so many women find such a hard time walking the line of being, am I too friendly, am, am, you know, am I overly friendly? Right, not friendly and enough. Not yeah. friendly enough, yeah. and you know, if so, am I perceived as the B word? I never got that from you. Like, you, you always had to smile, you always were very inviting. Um, obviously, you were intentional about not being too, you know, friendly with everybody. But you walk a line in a way that I, that I haven't seen many women in corporate environments be able to walk. What is the secret there? I mean, I think I'm also very. I don't know if it's just for women, but 
I think what is the foundation of what you're going into work, right? I am like I am a very happy person in general. Like because I wake up very grateful, like just for waking up. Like my mother has um, like advanced multiple sclerosis, so all my life, like I've seen her grow from waking up at 5 a.m., running miles, packing our lunch. She was like very, as you can imagine, like very energetic to like not physically being able to walk. <clears throat> but it didn't matter. Like I would come home at a, like when I come home from school, she's still like if she couldn't walk, she would have figured out how to put two boxes in a thing and a banana peel and put up a curtain and still make us. So she's always been like um, grateful, great sense of humor, and figures out how to get things done. Um, so for me, I'm like if I wake up and both my feet hit the ground, everything after that is added value. And no matter what your gender is or whatever gender you identify with. Um, I think I do, I, I really, really believe from my heart that like everyone has something to learn, and everyone has something to teach. So I think I try to approach every relationship like that because I really respect every human being. I think there's an opportunity for us to be the worst and the best. Um, and if I at all can send out any light that will reflect the best in you, um, I try to do it. And I, it works, like for me, like my husband even jokes, he was like, you live in like a charmed world. And I was like, maybe, but I think people tend to reflect what you give off. Um, so if I have a, a lot of wonderful experiences and people treat me well, I think it's because I treat people well. And that is gender agnostic. That's a great point. That's a great point that anybody can take, one male or female. It's a great point. I want to bring it back to your time um, working with Diddy and the Sean Combs Enterprises. I don't want to speak for you, but I have to believe one of your biggest achievements um, working within the organization would be Sarag Vaca, no? Yeah, no question. No question. I guess I'll let you put it in your own words, but can you explain to everybody what your role was in the inception of bringing that deal on board and growing that brand from being a failed brand into what it has become today? Yeah, so I was... Um I was, I was Puff's chief of staff at the time when we started having conversations about potentially getting into spirits. And um, when we looked at a partnership with Diageo, Diageo was number one in wine and spirits in the world. <clears throat> They'd had Ciroc Vodka for five years and had been doing terrible. And when um, Puff was like, oh, I'm interested in doing this, I went to him and said, you know, I'm trained in contract negotiations. I'd like to be a part of the negotiation team on this deal. He's like, all right, you can join it. Um, so me and the CFO at the time, small group of us, were instrumental in nine and a half months of negotiating. Um, we let the deal get done. <clears throat> Once the deal was closed with Diageo, um, I went back to him and said, marketing is the lifeblood of everything you're famous for. Everything you've ever built has been built on like your innovation and marketing. But at that particular time at Combs Enterprises, there was like no marketing team left. I was like, how are we going to launch this? I was like, it's October, November, December, 70% of liquor sales, math again, right? Liquor sales happen during this time period. We should launch now. Like, let's not wait. Let's go out. I was like, but I want to relaunch the agency you used to have called Blue Flame. I said, I will go, to, I will get it funded and I'll build out the plan. I was like, but I want to be the per, I want to lead the activities for this. I also <clears throat> used to run a small marketing company in Maryland. So <laughs> um, he Puff said, you can't do that if you replace yourself in my current role chief of staff. So I went to Diageo, I negotiated to get them to fund. I got the first, I think it was like the first $800,000 to start to build a team and to oversee the marketing budget. I put together a org, an org chart. Puff actually was helpful and was like, you should hire this person. He's helped me think about who we could bring on. Um, and that first nine months, we did incredible numbers. We were literally up a thousand percent in sales in over a hundred zip codes in the United States. Can we stop there for yeah. one second? Because I just want to bring, I mean, there's so many jewels and so many gems that you're dropping. I love the fact that you said, going into this, I am trained in contract negotiation. Spots opportunity, a skill set that you had going back, you know, 15 years now applies and you see an opportunity that you can advance your own career yes and and help the and help the company help close this deal and like, i had been with him for two years like he didn't know that either oh, right you so only with him for two years at that this time. was only two this was like this wow. is 2000 like actually a year and a half and i started 2005 so it was like 2006 and a half we started negotiations and then we launched in 2007 in the, in the uh, winter wow and, but, but, but i love even one better your chief of staff, like, you know, that's a, that's a big deal. Chief of staff for Sean Combs. So you're like, you know what? 
Everything that you've done has centered around marketing. Let me go and bring back Blue Flame Marketing. And not only that, I'll fund it. I'll get it funded. Nobody is going to say no to that. And all you have to do is replace yourself. The opportunities are always there. Right. But, number one, you have to believe in yourself. And you have to be able to see the opportunity and how you can bring value. So I'm sorry for cutting you off. We'll go back no, into that's the point. But I, I think that, that it's just incredible gems that people really need to understand because so many people sit and they wait for people to, for an opportunity to come to them. This is two instances back to back where you're saying, hey, I see opportunity. I see where I can bring value to what you're doing. And it helped you to move up. Yeah, I think that's the other thing too, is like just always thinking about what's next. Like it's uh, be impatient, be restless, right? Because you're right. Like it was, it's one of those situations where <clears throat> being chief of staff was terrific because I was able to learn about all the different businesses and it would have been very easy to do that job for 20 years. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not, for me, I'm like, I'm looking to, you know, Puff is amazing, but he is not a joke. It is a real 24 hour, can't stop, won't stop, make it have my enemies necessary all day long on the most boring Tuesday. Um, so I was like, if I'm gonna be working this level of intensity, I need a commensurate ROI. I'm not gonna get that being chief of staff. Um, so here was a real opportunity to participate in a business that hits the bottom line to drive actual revenue for him, for me, and for the entire company. Um, so, so the, the trick was though, the replacing yourself wasn't so easy. So, <laughs> so, so 12 months later, after we are going through two replacements that uh, were unsuccessful, um, the business was taking off and it was obvious that it was going to be at a minimum. And at that time, we didn't even know, but I looked to him, I said, look, I'm doing the math. We're gonna be able to, this is at least a hundred million dollar opportunity, which ended up being more than that, right? Um, I said, but I am, 12 months later, this business is doing crazy. Our partner's thrilled. I'm running the agency, but I'm also, I'm also booking your jets. I'm managing the chefs. I'm managing the rest of the team, planning your kids' birthday parties. Like it was literally like at that time, I used to have three phones and it was ridiculously like, yeah, I gotta need to hire 12 ambassadors in the city. We need to be in these 45 clubs. I wanna do push the Ciroc and lemonade drink, hang up and be like, yeah, he's turning seven years old. He went, <laughs> like, it was ridiculous. Um, and I went and I was like, Papa, Ma, I can't, we've gone through two chief of staffs. So I was like, you gotta either let me run this agency because I can't even look at an opportunity like this and not, and not be all the way in. Because what I won't do again, just because I'm protective of my own brand and I bring to the table, is like, I'm not doing things half ass. I won't do it. Um, and he was like, no, nah, no, nah, it seems fine. Things going great. Just, just keep doing both, basically. I resigned. I don't even know if you know I resigned. Really? Like, I'm not, not a, I just sent a beautiful, like, here's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out in 45 days. Here's my plan. I'm going to help you find somebody, but I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm not going to drive myself crazy like this. And I'm not, something's going to slip. And, uh, and he was like, okay, for 43 days. <laughs> and then the CFO walked in. On my last couple of days, I was like putting a file in. The CFO walked in and was like, Puff say, give you what you want. I was like, he's a smart man. He's a smart man. <laughs> and then we just, from there, we built Ciroc to being a, you know, a $2 billion retail value brand to this day. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. <laughs> D, I should have asked you this earlier. You come in, Puff's executive assistant. Mm -hmm. Two years later, you're yeah. president of Blue Flame. Two Is years two later, years? I was um, what do they call? I was uh, EVP, I think, of uh, Blue Flame originally. Long story short, you're a rocket ship. You're gone. Was there a lot of hate? And and I asked you this, and not trying to put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. But it's human nature. There were people who were with Puff before you got there, and more important, it's all men. It, you know, in, in the way Puff works, he has a lot of people around him who are, you know, they're close friends. They, they <laughs> yes. you know, they they might not necessarily have the skill set for what they're doing, but you know, he trusts them. They they're, they're very close to him. Yes. How did first and foremost? Was there a, a lot of pushback from, you know, people who were close to him? And secondly, how did you navigate it? If so? Yeah, so um, I think initially there was just a lot of curiosity of like, to your point, people are like, I've been working with him for 20 years. Like, mm -hmm. how are you, you know, what's happening? Like, what are you doing? Like, da, 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 da. And 
I think the thing that was a little different actually was a blessing for me in growing up in the company, even when I was promoted to president in 2017, like the most beautiful thing was assistants coming in, like, like other assistants coming in like, yo, like I could, you know what I mean? It's so encouraging. Like we're not faking when we say we promote from within. You know what I mean? Like, so I think people saw a, my work ethic. So anybody from that era will know, like, nah, she was in, a, she would be in the office till 3 a.m then be back with a fresh bun, like ready at 8 a.m. for the radio calls. You know what I mean? Like, so you could never deny that this was not some coincidence or some charm. I was busting my butt and it was very obvious. Um, there was probably, I will tell you, there was one, in my experience, probably only one person who I literally would say, you know, she has real issues. Like, it wasn't just me. Like, she's really, like, needed. I had actually went to Puff. I was like if, you, if you have, like, if you care about this person, you should invest in sending her. She needs deep, inpatient, 36 month treatment. Like I just, I can't heal her in this five minutes in the hallway. You know what I mean? Type of thing. But I mean, um, and for her, you know, I had to, you know, sometimes people can confuse kindness, right? So I definitely had to pull her aside because I don't want to ever embarrass anybody. And it was the same situation. It was a classic situation where she was out of pocket and I was like, hey, we're going to, let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation. Pull in the conference room. It was a real, like, you heard the staff, like, a, like it was a Western, like, <laughs> moment. Where we were, like, oh. But as soon as we, as soon as I closed the door, and I really started with it because it was a woman, and I was like, why are you embarrassing us like this? Like, if you have a problem, first of all, we're in this, all, it's all men, right? So, like, you going to have a problem with me, honey? I was like, we look, if you really have a problem, pull me aside at any time. I was like, but don't. I'm hearing you talking to outside vendors and you making up things like I'm a such the most transparent, transparent, like genuinely wants the best for people kind of person. I was like, this is this is just corny. I was like, if you have a real problem, I'm here right now. And she just burst into tears. I was like, I, I actually want, I was like almost one. I was like, I was hoping to kind of go run a job, but she was so like started crying. I was like, oh, <laughs> and I mean, that was honestly the end of it. I mean, I'm not like everybody has their own faith, but like I'm a, I, you know, as a Christian woman, I, for me, I really do try to think through like how can I is there anything small I could do that could be helpful to a person and I think I was able to not have like unless you know something I don't know enormous levels of hate because along the way I really did try to make things better for for all of us you know what I mean like and I really also valued what people's contributions were so like to me when I came in the door take like a Harve Pierre who built bad boy records mm -hmm. I'm so respectful I'm like I don't you know what I'm saying like you take a and obviously Harv works around the clock, but like if Harv didn't want to work, he don't got to work. He's the reason we all got jobs today. So like I think I've always come in the door with a level of respect of like, oh, you've been with Puff for 30 years? You've been doing something that I haven't been doing. I respect that and what can I learn from you, even if it's just one thing. Um, so for me, I didn't have a, t I don't think I had a ton of it, or if I did, I just didn't notice. Well, I think it's, oh, it, it, it's natural, right? Because when I came into Bad Boy, there, there were people who were there before me, right? Yes. And as you move up and you surpass people, it's, 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 it's human nature. So I just was wondering if you experienced it and just how do you handle something like that? Because there are people who are coming into companies sure. and you know, the goal is to do well, the goal is to move up. And sometimes when you move up, you're gonna move past people who have sure. been in the building yeah. much longer than you have. So, you know, I just think that- I don't even care. I mean, to a certain degree, like I try to, I, I'm also very clear about like, we're, it's called work. Correct. It's not the beach. You know what I'm saying? Like lexicon matters. So like I'm coming to work to work and I try to uh, I try to be as friendly and as helpful to people as I can be. But I'm really blessed to have a I have a wonderful family. I got like the baddest friends, dopest girl group you ever met. You know what I mean? We're like talk about them. Yeah. Like I'm a loving husband, beautiful six year old. So I'm like, you know, what I'm saying I'm, I hope I try to build, you know, relationships in life. But if not, I'm, I'm super good. I don't got to make no more friends forever. Like you know what I'm saying, <laughs> I'm super good. <laughs> yeah, I really think you have to, you know, have confidence in yourself. And, and you know, having that core structure is so important. And yeah. so, so often people look for that in outside, um, outside communities. And everybody's not going to take you in. As long as you have your core group, you're fine. Yeah. We speak a lot about Puff, and I want to come back to him um, because he's such a big part of your story. But what's it like to work for Dia Sims? So my general philosophy is like, hire hard, manage light, right? So um, I, I, I have one of my players, so she may be like, I don't know how light you manage. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but in general, um, I really try to get people who are enormously 
they're bringing something to the table already, right? Really, and Puff actually says this, is like we try to hire people who are smarter than us, better than us. I want to hire people that I can learn from. Um, but I do have extremely high expectations, right? So that is the part that's going to be the trick of like, I know, I know almost everything is possible, so I'm not comfortable with people who are comfortable with like, I don't know, you know what I mean, no without an option, right? We can't figure things out. Um, so for me, if you're working for me, you need to be solution oriented. You need to be fast, but not at the sacrifice of excellence. Um, and then you need to be, uh, for me, I do care about, like I said this earlier, I like people to be around that are like happy and grateful. I just, I work too much to be around people that's like miserable. I don't, <laughs> I don't like, now if it's something that I could help you fix, like if you're like, oh, like you got a real problem, like a life issue, then let's hold hands and figure out how we gonna solve that. Everybody, nobody can be happy all the time. But for me, I try to be, um, I try to be really clear and spot issues in the moment, you know what I mean? So that people are not confused or six months later finding out like, well, I thought you loved this particular project I handed mm -hmm. and you never told me. So mm -hmm. I try to give real time feedback so we can adjust accordingly. And I like to also be really, really clear about the overall goal. You said something earlier about like moving past people. I don't really feel like, I, I think every relationship, every healthy relationship is requited. And whatever your title is really means nothing because it's critically important. So. I, when you work for me, I have this approach, and not to bring it to Puff, but I'll give an example of when I used to hire for him as chief of staff. I would be like, please don't think like the tie he puts on is not important. You're his personal assistant, you're working on valet things today. You pick the wrong tie, and he goes on TV today. That affects our extremely profitable tie business, potentially, right? Which affects the 303 sales reps that sell ties in Macy's around the country. That affects the profit we have for our Christmas party and the extra five vacation days everybody gets this year, right? So like every, I need people for me, and this is the part that could be tricky if you work for me, I'm like, it all matters. Please don't think like, oh, I just misspelled this word. Nah, no, nah, I'm a black woman, so people are looking for me to fail. Everything needs to be flawless when I submit it, and if you're on my behalf, I need it to be flawless as well. The other thing for me is personal attention matters. Puff has been an expert. This is something that he and I just agreed on. I've done it separately all my life. He's done it all his life, and it was just a good, simpatico matchup, is going that extra step matters. When I used to promote parties, the top 200 people that came all the time, I knew all their drinks. Oh, such and such, you love the Malibu and this, such and such, whatever it is. Like, if I know somebody, if I'm working with somebody on a regular basis, I'm gonna know their birthday, I'm gonna know their kids' names, I'm not gonna really know, but I'm gonna have it in my notes. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? But I'm a, I need to, you need to care a little bit more, and if you work for me, I want you to reflect the level of attention to the whole person that you're working with, not just somebody being used as a commodity. Listening to you speak, and I say this all the time, Success, it's intentional. It's an intentional endeavor. Ah, how many hours does D of Sims work? I, I work around the clock. Yeah, realistically, I mean, I work, I work, I'm more intentional now since I've had a daughter mm -hmm. about like getting dedicated time with her and like sleeping, you know, through the night, like six, seven hours. But I would say before then, we, I, we, we, you know, work all around. And I actually don't recommend that, right? So in the early days, like it was a, you know, I'm sure y'all all heard that like we don't sleep, sleep's the cousin of death. We all definitely lived in that, in that, in that whole movement. I would look at my phone for years and I could see where like you're texting it, my Blackberry at the time, you could see you stop emailing at like 4.58 and then you pick it back up at seven, particularly in the roles that I had because it was on both sides. You have Puff and all the artists, they're up they're up till like 6 a.m. in the studio. They don't right. start, but I still got to be up for calls with Estee Lauder and Diageo and all of our corporate counterparts that start at 8 a.m. At some point, I got to jump in the shower. You know what I mean? Like, so, so your days would really be 24 hours. Um, I actually, I think you guys are so fortunate. You don't have to work like that, right? Um, when you look at our, our grandparents or great grandparents were spending all of their time, they were like literally churning butter, riding horse. Like you don't have to do any of that stuff. You got Google, you don't have to go to the encyclopedia. So you should be able to be more efficient with your time and you actually shouldn't have to grind the way we have so you can have whole and complete lives and travel and have deep relationships and still be a beast at what you do. I think success is not only intentional, it's also available for everybody, right? Like there's no bias, no zip code has a lock on genius. So I feel like don't think um, success is some uh, segregated, difficult place. It's available for all of you. 
Uh, it really, really is with the level of intentionality and consistency. And the real measure of success is legit being happy, right? And, and I will say, like, some financial freedom, of course, can make that a little bit easier. I, I just, it really is available for you if you figure out what you want to do and focus on it and dedicate the time to it. Um, I think something I see a lot is, and shoot, I tell this to Puff, too. He suffers for this himself. It's like you can... You can do anything, but you can't do everything, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, so it's like you can. I, I talk to a lot of young people who have so talented in so many different things, and I know it's a gig economy, but sometimes it's helpful to be ruthlessly focused on doing the hell out of one thing first, at least, um, and killing that. And that's where you meet success. Wow. <laughs> so many gems drop. Whoa. Dear. Uh and I almost don't know where to go from there <laughs> because it was so much you just said. But just to move this along, and I told you I would come back to this point. You're a double minority, woman, mm -hmm. African-American. Your giving back has been, and I've watched it and I've seen it, so it's not just something that I'm talking about, but anybody watching this won't know. Can we talk about your La Bella Mafia? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't, this was given, name given to us, by the way. Uh, 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 <laughs> um, yeah, so I, again, I'm in, so I'm intentional about a couple of things with making sure that there are women represented in the rooms. I've been really fortunate that I just grew up with just a lot of, like, who would have known at seven years old that the women that I were friends with just ended up being so, like, brilliant, boss, just badass women. But I'm also very intentional about looking around at Combs Enterprises, particularly about saying, like, there's no reason for it to be only male executives when the population is 50% women. And I went out and was like, hey, here's some brilliant women, let's bring them in. And they came and they also helped make additional great revenue for the company. Um, I think I also go out of my way whether I know, if I'm in a room, which to this day, nothing has changed from when I was 21, um, negotiating $100 million defense contracts and I was the youngest and the only black woman in the room, to Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like where I'm typically still at I mean, how old I am? At 44, you know what I mean? Honestly, still sometimes the youngest and the only woman and the only black in the room. So that's terrible, right? Like we need, I need all y'all to help with that change because it shouldn't be the same 20 years later. Um, but I do try to be really intentional about when there is any other, any other minority in the room of any underserved population, I go out of my triple way to be like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry wait. I'm sorry, Jane, were you saying something? Because you have to support each other. I've seen so many times like women saying something being talked over or, you know what I mean, the Spanish person's not being listened to or somebody from another country's there and like people can't understand their accent so they don't listen. It's just like, no, be, we need to bring respect. And if you, have, if you have the ability to, if you have the microphone, you know what I mean, then I try to make sure I use it to say like, nope, everybody has a platform. I have one example and she talks about this too. Um, chef, one, of, one of Puff Chef's uh, her name was Chef Jordan. She was um, interviewing for a role to be Puff's personal chef when I was the chief of staff. And she had just come from Seattle. She had never done like celebrity chef work before, but he loved her food and wanted to hire her. So I went, I was like, hey, we want to hire you. And I said, what kind of conversation would you like? And the amount she said was way crazy low for New York, for the role. And just knowing what the average role was. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't know her for anything except for interviewing her. And I was like, no, go on payscale.com, go on Sherm. If y'all don't know this too, S-H-R-M, go on Sherm. Um, and then you can look and put in like what this job is, the zip code you're going to be working. It will tell you what the market rate is. I will be here. Come back in an hour. And she came back in an hour with an appropriate rate. We negotiated it. And what I got out of that in return, right, it wasn't some altruistic thing for me. It was now I had a woman who was like, damn, this company actually cares about me. Once she's getting paid what she deserves, what she should. And whatever side of the table you're on, you need to make sure you're standing up for each other. To this day, like she went on to be a hugely successful TV shows, work for a bunch of celebrities. Um, to this day, she's like she puts those same practices in place when she's interviewing and she's hiring. Um, so I think you have to you have to do more than talk about it. You know what I mean? I think you have to advocate with your hands and feet. And I try to I try as much as I can to live like that. Yeah, because I, you really did change the culture of Babel Entertainment overall. Like you really placed women in leadership positions across the brand. Um, and about, it was the most profitable time, too, by the way. <laughs> you, you always talk about math matters. It matters. It matters. Why does it matter to have women in leadership positions? It just, so the, this is, again, this is 
people tend to approach it like it's some charitable thing, but it's just not, right? So um, I'll give you a couple examples. There's a <clears throat> a fund, uh, a research group actually called Quantopian out of Boston, they did research on this, that showed that um, when you look at the S&P 100, women CEOs typically outperform three to one versus male CEOs. Just last week, CNBC reported an updated version of a similar study. This was the full S&P 500, was showing that women in their first two years of appointment as CEO performed 20% higher on stock returns. 20%, just to be, just to really make this clear, if you just throw your money in a mutual fund, like a good mutual fund, you will get like 5%. Well, 20% is like so not a fluke, it's a level of intentionality. And to be honest, I don't even think it's, it's not so much about women versus men. I think it's more about, because I could say like if women were in power for the next 100 years, it probably would flip. But I think whenever you are the underserved population and you're accustomed to working four times as hard, whatever, whether you're handicapped or a veteran or woman or, you know what I mean, or black, you're likely going to quadruple your efforts to get to ROI and the math just bears out for it. So I always say this about particularly when women hires, I'm like, you don't have to do it for your heart, do it for your wallet. Like you're doing a disservice <laughs> to your shareholders if you don't have women in leadership. Wow. Let me take a step back for a second. You're married 12 years? 12 years, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. That is the hardest. So I won't even ask you about work-life balance because I don't know that it exists. Does, does it, exist. it does does, it? Nobody. That's a fake. That's a that's a pan. That's like so fake. I like, I like ban that that whole terminology. I don't think it, it's a mirage. Like you just be thirsty trying to find it in the desert. Like there is no work-life balance. Not for women. Not now. Not the women I know. I heard you say a quote, and I, and I don't want to mess your quote up, but you're saying something about juggling. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I always say, um, I'm like, I don't want to be doing too much at once, right? It's like juggling balls in the air, and that's what clowns do. Like, I'm not in the circus. I'm interested in being a clown. I was like, what I try to do is be in a batting cage and, like, knock that thing out the park in that moment. I'm with my daughter at the, I was just a Tuesday night at the science fair. I'm going to be in the science fair caring about her, her project in that moment. I'm in a room with my new cannabis business negotiating a $100 million deal. I'm going to be all the way in that moment. And you got to know when you're in that moment, something's suffering. It's just not, it's just, you just can't do anything about it. It just is what it is. So you may as well, knowing that, just get the most you can out of that moment that you're in. You know, we're talking about you, but I want to I turn the table for a second, right? You're talking about being in a specific moment. You must have the best husband on the planet. He was right? so. He was <laughs> You know, so many men, I don't know what he does for a living, right? But so many men are threatened by successful women. And you work around the clock, you're traveling, you are CEO. This man. <laughs> Where'd you find them? <laughs> <laughs> Literally Disney World. Like we met at Disney World <laughs> um, in Orlando at a conference um, a long time ago. Uh, and it's funny because I was in a relationship and I kept trying to hook him up with my friend. I was no like, no, no, way. no, I don't want to date you. But I got my friend, oh, you're going to love her. He was like, I don't want to date your friend. <laughs> like for years, like for years. Um, well, I think my husband's successful in his own right. He's in pharmaceuticals and uh, legit with a Japanese company. And um, he's very confident. I think that's what you need, right, on his own. And I think the partnership is, I think it's better than, you know, everybody has to go their own way. But I do think I am still an advocate for, like, relationships matter. And things you could do together, to me, are incremental than what you could do apart. Whether that's with, like, to me, like, my friends, the things that I can get done with, with their thought partnership, um, and encouragement, I know is more than I could do individually. Um, so yeah, it's certainly been a blessing to have um, such a great husband. It's not been easy. I mean, when we got, <clears throat> we got married, our wedding was seven days after Puff's white party, if you're familiar with that. So I had planned this white party in the Hamptons, two white parties, his white party and my wedding. And um, it was very, you know, it was very challenging. I told him actually at the time, I was like, well, um, cause we, I lived in Atlanta at the time. So he'd asked me to move to Atlanta when we got married. I was like, well, I'm going to commute for like six months to a year and then I'll find something in Atlanta. And that was like 2007. So you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah, that was the real fake out that you gave me when we got married. Um, but I also, I, I believe deeply in relationships in many ways. This is probably very <clears throat> again, counterintuitive to what way people uh, move today. I'm old fashioned in the sense that I do, for the most part, feel like the man is the head of the household unless he needs to be overthrown, right? Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So I operate, I, I try to be like a great wife. You know what I mean? I also feel like 
to the intensity of the moment that you're in, I'm, I'm appreciative of what he brings to the table. I treat him as a leader of our household. And, um, and, and he deserves it. So I think, you know, that's, that's work for us. When we first got married, I was very um, appreciative. He literally set up different couples who had been married for like 20 years, 40 years, 60 years. And like for the first year we got married, we'd like go to dinner with all these different couples and just ask them, you know, their secrets. And this is legit. Is a reigning thing was like one of us traveled all the time. I was like, okay, so we nailed it. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we stayed married for 60 years because one of us was always going to have this. <laughs> so uh, that, has, that has worked for us. <laughs> so nice. Good for you. And congratulations you. on 12 years. Thank I want to bring it back to work for a second. Um, I know we said Ciroc Vodka has got to be, you know, your crowning achievement yeah. working with, with Diddy. I would have to believe your second, if not a very close second, if not the first, would have to be your involvement in the charter school. Can you talk to us about that? Definitely. Um, and Puff will say the same thing. There's nothing more important than these schools. Um, so uh, similar thing about like Puff's dedication to doing impossible things. Opening up a school in New York is extraordinarily difficult. And you could ask a thousand advisors and everybody would tell you, do not do it. We know because we did. And Puff had been saying for years, well, I want to open up something in Harlem. And we're like, let's do a program, let's do an after school program, let's go. <laughs> He's like, no, I want to open up a school. I want to be dedicated to this population that's not being served. Um, and we were really fortunate to partner with Dr. Perry, who is a genius in the space and understands how to um, really super serve these populations. As an example, the school in Harlem, Capital Prep, uh, we were getting kids coming in three grades behind in math and reading wow. in their initial year. Crazy thing is within, within a year, they were catching up like two and a half years. Our point of view was like, that's horrible news, because if it's even possible, we should be doing this everywhere, right? So we're so happy now that we have Connecticut and Harlem. We got approved for the charter in the Bronx um, early this year. And it means so much to me that <clears throat> even though um, I left Combs Enterprises, the one thing that I kept was staying on the board of the Capital Prep Schools. And I encourage anybody, I know we're in, I know just a little bit, but we always encourage people to come tour the school. The kids run the school, they are phenomenal. I never see anybody come and not end up the day like in tears because these kids' stories are so moving and their transition, not beyond honestly what they're learning in terms of math and science and reading, but their character and their confidence evolution is extraordinary. Wow. Can you 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 mentioned Dr. Perry? Yes. Do you mind speaking on his behalf? Like, who is Dr. Perry? For anybody who is not aware who Dr. Perry is, this is a phenomenal individual. Can you let everybody in the audience know? Yeah, no, Dr. Stephen Perry has dedicated his life to education and serving um, minority populations who are not getting the level of education and the level of, like, personality development that's needed. Um, he has a hugely successful school uh, in Connecticut that he started that we're now uh, joined together with him that outperforms schools that are triple resourced um, and it very much comes down to a level of dedication and intensity but it's also around ensuring these kids understand their worth and their value and that the way they treat each other and the way that they um, down to everything the way they open doors the way their uniform is the words that they use the lexicon the ability to speak extemporaneously if you go into any classroom in any capital prep school on any day there'll be a kid who can step up it, it, like right if you just walk in there they'll explain to you our lesson for today is this this is what we're working on blah 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 it's an important skill set that is being lost I think in a technical age to be able to articulate yourself well and surmise what you're doing in that moment and then feel confident with whoever your audience is and he is dedicated to ingratiating these kids with these skills and when you go in and see fourth graders that know their stuff like that and have the confidence off the cuff and some of them in their third month it's like could you imagine if these kids were raised with this type of initiative from birth um, so he 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 is such a, a minister of that gospel, um, definitely worth looking up, and he's a phenomenal speaker as well. He really is. He definitely is worth somebody um, that you should look up. What are you doing in your downtown? We spoke about work <laughs> across the board. What, <laughs> what are you doing? For one, do you ever have downtime, and what do you do? Um, I don't, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me is, I, like everybody, I love my my family and my friends. I love, probably the thing that I missed the most would be like, was reading, because I'm a geek. And um, so if I had time, like, people would be like, Yo, what would be your dream? It would be like, could I have eight days of reading books all day? It would be so exciting. <laughs> um, and then um, I, I just, I love like, just laughing with my friends, to me, to be honest. The most fun would be like my friends or my husband or my daughter, and like just chilling with someone in the house and 
So that's a telling story. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not that exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this cannabis endeavor you're on. Yes, yes. This is the next chapter. Yes, yes. So, um, so even before that, and as this is a, this is an opportunity I think for everybody is <clears throat> when you look at um, when you look at kind of the American economy and current state of business and the failure of uh, American corporations to be truly diverse in any way. We now have an industry, right? We have an opportunity that is, uh, cannabis is relatively in its infancy, where we can actually try to build it in the right way. I mean, this is the thing that was exciting to me. It was like, damn, really, it's still not legal federally the way it should be, um, but already, 80% of CEOs in the industry in the United States are all white men. Nothing against white men, but they can't have 80%. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, I mean, this is, a, this is a real opportunity. They are projecting, forget um, like THC, the component of cannabis that actually would get somebody to get high, just on the CBD side is projecting out to be a $40 billion industry just in the United States in the next decade. Like if you could get wow. 0.0002%, you know what I mean? Like th start thinking about things like that, getting, looking around the states that are looking for licenses, look around about like maybe you could get in the accessory side. There's something in every piece of this business, whether it is, um, oh, you know what? They're starting to use CBD more in spas. Maybe I want to be the expert massage therapist that uses CBD. So I, I, before I even talk about what I'm doing, think about what you're going to be doing because there's a lot of money being made. I've seen, I've seen a guy in the last 12 months go from 12 million a year to 20 million. I mean, he told me about the last three years, but go from 12 million a year to 20 million to 200 million a year. It's just one. This is one kid that's happening all over. We deserve, you know what I mean, a piece of that pie. So for me, I couldn't sit on the sidelines and watch this industry grow like this and not be a part of it, which is why I launched the Burn Group in July. Uh, I was fortunate to have great founders. We were able to raise um, about $18 million the first week of July. We've been hiring. Um, I have a couple people here in New York and an office in Toronto. We're focused on um, e-commerce. Um, we have a outstanding team in um, in Canada. They actually do all of the e-commerce for Drake, um, OVO, which just launched in Japan, the Raptors, the Hawks are part of our team. And then uh, we do obviously traditional branding and then the other pieces we uh, have a distribution. So <clears throat> the distributors that I've worked with in Spirits are now trying to get into a CBD game to try as they should. And um, my team basically specializes in helping them pick exactly which brands should go into 500 CVS's around the country or all the Walmarts around the country and not only get in but because we understand branding We know what it takes to get out right and make sure that you have phenomenal brands. Um, so it's called the burn group BRN um, Look it up follow us and I'm um, expecting to build you know, hopefully the uh, the uh, what do you call it? I don't know the cannabis is rock <laughs> <laughs> Did I hear this right you you said you were on the spirit side well, what happens is, yeah, so right now we're, um, the distributors that I work with are the same distributors that okay. are huge in the spirit, in the space, spirit space, right? So now they're looking at like, okay, well, how can we get a part of this action essentially? And my company is leading them in terms of like, these are the brands you should work with. This is where they should be. This is how you, you know, how you roll it out into different spaces. I won't, I won't, I won't bore you with this, but one of the things that was successful with Ciroc was I was very uh, intentional about um, what's called channel strategy. So one little example would be, like I built the Ciroc Vodka in the military channels, and it was mostly an ignored channel for this kind of space. You actually were part of this too. Mm -hmm. And um, we were able to sell just like 300,000 cases in a channel that people didn't pay as much attention to. So when you think about selling products, it's not always just the traditional spaces of like, I just wanna get in and sell it in Target, like thinking through like, hmm, is there an opportunity in a pet store? Is there an opportunity on this.com? You know what I mean? And how can you, how can you be now in your focus? Do you ever have any challenges? And I guess I ask this more from a morality standpoint. You were in the spirits business, now you're in the cannabis business. Yes. Um, but you're such a sweetheart. <laughs> like, but, but I guess at the end of the day, you're, you're shocked. You want to make money. <laughs> but, but there any times when you're sitting and you're like, hmm, definitely. Maybe, you know, the businesses I'm in, they're, they're lucrative, but. Of course. I mean, I would say um, really just more so for like the amount of energy. Um, I know you had Derek, I think, on last week and mm -hmm. uh, Derek Ferguson was the CFO for many years at Combs Enterprise. He also was like the resident minister. And I would definitely occasionally go in and be like, for all this work I'm doing, I probably could be like saving lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so I think more so I absolutely do struggle with like, how could I put this level of energy and making sure like it's, it's real 
you know, making sure I was doing the best I can for a community. Now, on the flip side, even with Ciroc, I feel very proud of, like, I've gone into, I've gone into, I remember going into when Ciroc Peach launched, it was so big, I went to a liquor store in Atlanta, and this guy was like, he was telling me how he had made so much money in four months, he was not going to be able to send his daughter to college. Like, the amount of jobs wow. we created, the amount of the next 110 rappers who got deals because of our deal, who were able to each hire 50 people, like, I feel very good about our contributions in, in, in these businesses where we should be represented, right? They're in American commerce and they're legal, we should be represented. So I feel good about that. But particularly in the cannabis space, I am looking at his early days, um, but I have been talking to um, some celebrity talent around, I was like, it's, it's unreasonable, it's ridiculous that in one state somebody's making $100 million and in the next state somebody's in jail for the same thing. I was like, we, we have to figure out, and I think that the work that, um, uh, reform is doing what Meek and Jay and Mike Rubin and those guys are doing in prison reform. It's like we need to help. What happens when you get them out, right? They're doing a lot of the great work of like, how do we get people out of jail for these stupid things they shouldn't be in jail for? But then what? You've been in jail for six years for, for weed, which is ludicrous. Um, then you come out and now you're at a, uh, a disadvantage. I was like, where we could help is with that transition. How do you transition either A, from the black market, or B, how do you teach somebody the proper entrepreneurship skills or really advocate for them and make sure they have the right legal support? Um, this is something I talked to Puff about a year and a half ago when I first was like, I think I want to leave. He was like, what do you want to do? I was like, the biggest gap I see, honestly, is in legal support. Like, you have people who are going to jail just because they have terrible lawyers. You know what I mean? I was like, we should, we need to figure out and bring back like the, the feeling of the 1980s legal defense fund, or 1970s really, um, LABCP, and make sure like you get best in class, legal support, eight two people out, and then when they get out, what are they gonna do next? Um, so my dream would really be to, you know, build this thing up, sell it in three years, and then I would love to spend the rest of my life just focused on that. That's amazing, Dia, that's amazing. Just wrapping this thing up, what would you say the biggest impact that Puff has had on your life? I mean, I think you, everybody needs somebody to believe in them. And um, I appreciate the, like, the biggest impact, I think, was the trust he had in me to, to do things I had never done before. Like, we, we were both new to the spirits industry, and, you know, we would just come up with crazy ideas, and for him to be like, yeah, just go do it. Um, it was a wonderful model, and I... And I hope I can emulate it moving forward for somebody to be like, yeah, I believe in you and I believe we can do this. Because honestly, in some ways, like trust is the best investment, you know? Conversely, what would you say the biggest impact that you've had on Puff's life? Um, I, I honestly think he, he may even say this was, I think I actually did impact his management style. Um, if you see, if you go to him now, if you go look to his employees now, like I think he saw like she's really getting a lot out of people and being kind at the same time. You know what I mean? Like understanding how to motivate people by, by believing in them, by trusting them, finding out what are their strengths, by showing off and showcasing what they are. Like I would go to my team, like if somebody was great, I would not try to hide them from being great. I'm like, you're great at this. Like let's get you, I'm going to help you get pressed for what you can do. Like, like explaining how the better people are, the better we all are. Like, I think sometimes it can be scary. I think Puff was much more of a, like, I have 100 great people. I want to know where they are and have them dedicated to this one mission instead of being like, if we got 100 great people and they go out and launch 100 dope companies in the community, then we got 100 allies out here in the world and we changing things. And I think he really has taken that on as a mission. And I feel like he's been so dedicated in what, the work he's doing with the Revolt Summit now to more of the... Um, Reginald F. Lewis model of like, it's not about how many millions I make, it's about how many millionaires I make. And I feel, I think, I think he would say that I helped to influence that thinking. That's amazing. And, and you bring up something that I, I think that, um, I would do this interview a disservice without asking you. Puff is a creature of habit. He really is. And when you do a phenomenal job, when you, when you come into the company, and you really kill it at your position, that's where he wants you to stay. He wants, you know, he can rely on you. He knows you do the best job. How did you, you know, just coming off of that last answer that you just said, how did you get him to see you as more again and again and again to 
You took over all of the businesses. Um, I think you are trying to just approach it by like irrefutable science, like continually showing like this is how this thing has been made better. I could do this same thing. Like it's more of a, again, like it's a it's a way of doing things than than the actual subject matter of like, okay, I built this Ciroc, right? Now you want to have a television station. Like we just sat when that opportunity came up for Revolt, right? I was like, well, I want to be on the jump, you know, I helped be part of the jump team to get the television, get awarded out of 150 other um, applicants for it. It was just him and Magic who got selected because of the work that we put together, helped to find a CEO, take off the ground. I never worked in that before. But I think um, being able to show like this thing worked, now we're going to take this thing, lift it up, and build this next thing. Uh, and the other thing is like in any relationship, <clears throat> I think you have to make sure that you ha each have independent value, right? Like the best relationships are when two people come and like you, you're great, you know what I'm saying? You're great on your own and you're just killing it when you're together. I think it's always been clear, and I've been very clear to him about this, like I, I'm, I choose to be at Col you know what I'm saying? I, like, I'm, you're right, I was like the advocate of like, we're Combs Enterprises now, like we're growing up. We're not just music. I love Bad Boy Records, but now we're on to the next thing, something that I advocated for. Um, I think it was always very transparent and I've been unabashed about like, um, I'm, I will be good wherever I am, you know what I mean? And I'll be just as happy, you know, selling strawberries or pencils or Ciroc vodka, right? You know what I mean? So like, I'm like, and, and Puff is amazing and he could hire anybody he wants to, right? So I think it's important that before that, it, it's a beautiful, had been a beautiful family environment, mm -hmm. but sometimes like, you always want to hire your cousins, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and it was much more like, a, what's the mutual respect? Um, so I think I was able to continually demonstrate increased value that could be sticky in a variety of scenarios by showing how this thing worked here. Now we're going to lift it and apply it here. Last couple of questions. What's the best advice you ever received? Um, I think the best, this is not directly to me, but um, before, before I started with Combs Enterprises, um, I, I don't know, I was watching something or oh, Leo Cohen, who's a very... Um, well-respected music executive in the industry was asked to describe Puff and he said he said just one thing he said he's necessary and I told he was my boyfriend at the time but my husband's time I was like if I'm gonna take this job I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out how to become necessary because <clears throat> it's a very different thing to be you could be liked at your job it doesn't necessarily create value you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily drive your price up. But it's just like, you know what your plumber can charge you if your water don't work and he can fix it? You know what I'm saying? On the way, you know what I mean? Like, it's a, that's necessary. Like, so I was like, I need to come in in a different and think about like, what tool do you need by any means necessary? Um, and for me, that was, that was really valuable. I, I do a lot of speaking on negotiation. And one thing I tell, again, particularly women is, don't confuse um, like affection or affinity for value. And I use these, <clears throat> the fruit, Grapes, as an example. Like, most people love grapes. Like, most people like grapes. Nobody hates grapes, right, for the most part. But typically, if you go someplace and you want it, somebody says, like, oh, would you like this mango steam martini or lychee martini? You may pay a little more for that than you would, like, a grape flavor thing because grape feels like an everyday thing, even though you like it better than some sexy fruit that had to be brought in from the Maldives, right? So like, don't, like, you might just be the grapes at your organization, and everybody be like, she's so dope. Oh, you want a raise, girl? Nah. This person who I don't like that much, that's necessary, they get in the raise. But you have to balance being necessary with your likability. That's great advice. Okay. Um, what's the worst advice you ever received? Well, it's funny. So when, I mentioned early on that when I, um, when I accepted this job, I called, I had all the music labels in um, New York as my clients. So on my last day at Power 105, you know, you send out the email like, oh, I'm going to a new venture, here's my new information. I had like two, literally two hours of people calling me because again, Puff is amazing, but you know, he has a little reputation for being tough to work for. And the job actually that I was specifically taking had been like four people had failed at it like in the last year. So people were calling me like, don't take that job. You shouldn't go over there, da, da, da. Like, back, like at least 13 people, back to back to back. I'm like, nah, I was like, I'm good. I'm, it's gonna be good or it's not gonna be good, but I'm gonna be good. Like, you know what I'm saying, like either <laughs> way, right? Um, and you know, obviously, um, I'm glad I didn't listen to any of them, any of them um, cause I would have been, you know, I feel like this was the right move for me. Trusting yourself and believe in yeah. your ability. Yeah. 
and be okay with failing. I was okay if it didn't work out. That's the other thing. Like, it's gotta, you gotta be okay with taking the risk of like, maybe it doesn't work. Something's gonna, I'll get something out of it and then I'll go do something else. That's great advice because so many people don't do because they're afraid of failure. They're afraid to take the risk because they might fail. Last question for you. What advice would you give to your 21 year old self? Um, yeah, I think I kind of touched on this earlier. I think I definitely, because I can see the possibilities in a lot of things, would be willing to be like, oh, we should do this. Yeah, let's, let's think of this idea. Let's start this company. Let's write this book. Let's launch this party. Let's, you know what I mean? And I, you can divide your precious time up too much chasing too many dreams. Um, you know, I think everything happens for a reason. I won't really, I'm not one to really look back, but I would say the power of just make a decision and to make that decision the right decision is invaluable. I always say that there is supreme power in just making a decision. I literally wrote that in a text today. Give it up for this week's power. Thank Board. you. <laughs>